Okay, I guess we are live. Uh, welcome, Dev. It's great to see you again, man. Hey, good to see you too, Garrett. Good to see you too. And I think this video right now, we're going live to, to the Radical on Doing YouTube, but I think uh, Dev will be posting this to his YouTube later, so you guys can check it out yeah. there as well. Um, yeah, so I guess it's been a while since we had a discussion, right? Oh, we did one before I put on the workshop in England. Was that the last one? Last fall? No, no I don't remember. I mean, it must be like the best part of the year, maybe a little bit less, something like that. Yeah, wow. Time just blazes by, man. Uh, and I got in touch with my my good friend and, and uh, amazing client, uh, Jonah, uh, Jonah Robbins. He's been on my YouTube quite a bit, but he mentioned the other day I was talking to him. He's like, hey, man, when, when are you going to talk to Dev again? And I was like, ah, oh, that's when I wrote you the message. So I thought, oh, okay. I better okay. get in touch. So, so shout out to Jonah. power. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's nice to, nice to be together here. Uh, so uh, as I... As you folks maybe have read in the uh, the um, description, we're going to talk a little bit about typological systems. So I'll I'll first explain why I'm generally against those, and and with some caveats. But uh, what I've seen lately is this uh, human design. It's like blowing up, and so I looked into it a little bit, and to me, it looks like another let's let's call it uh, complicated horoscope. I'll, I'll give it that label, meaning the practitioner gets some data about you, your birthday, where you're born or something like this. And then they write up, then they put you into a category. And then in from within that category, uh, you get a bunch of things or you tend to be like this. You tend to be like that. You're more likely to fall in love with this per type of person and not that type. And then it gets people into a, um, it's like a complete mindset and way of behaving that I, I find people respond to it similar to the way they would respond to a psychiatric diagnosis. Now, I'm not completely against diagnostic tools, especially for practitioners. Maybe there, there are some uses for them. I can think of use cases for this type of stuff, um, especially for body-based typological systems where you can see like what Reich would call character structure from the body structure itself and from the habits and the ways that people are utilizing their body. Okay. Then you see those patterns, then you can attack those patterns in a, a multitude of different levels. Okay. So I, so I'm not arguing against those, although I might not always tell a client, okay, you fall into this body type because I don't want them running off studying that. And then, having their mindset be around that. I want them to get relief. I want them to flow with their lives. I want them to seek truth. Uh, but I don't want them running off conducting another study of the problem. You know what I mean? So with uh, human design, for example, there's, there's a great study uh, that was, I don't know when this was done. And then Darren Brown has duplicated it. And so I have some cold readers where they give a, ask the whole group to give their birth date and, and time and place and draw uh, an outline of their hand on a piece of paper. And this will go to the great psychic uh, astrologer. And that person will give a reading to everyone. And what they did was gave everyone in the group the exact same uh, reading. And it was made by a cold reader. And then they asked the people, um, uh, give a percentage for how much this describes you. And people were saying 80 to 90%, almost always above 50%, uh, when it had a supernatural source of the, of the data, uh, then the opposite group would get, uh, would be given a psychological profile test and then given the results of that. And they would say often it would fall under 50%, but they gave them the exact same thing, but from a psychological scientific source, not a supernatural source. So there's a lot of things you can kind of speculate about with that study. But what I found, let me turn that off, sorry. But what I've, uh, found is that people will latch on to some typological system make a study of it, try to analyze all their friends and their families from within that system, use it as an excuse sometimes. Like, oh, I'm a Taurus, so that's why I do this, you know. Uh, so that's what I mean by these systems will wreak havoc on the seeker because it'll derail the process of seeking after truth and put it into this whole study of someone else's sometimes arbitrary uh, system. You know, so that's kind of the, the foundation I wanted to lay for the conversation mm -hmm. uh, and then make, a, you know, a counterpoint with the like what Lowen was able to do, looking at have people do uh, the bow 
exercise in mental hospitals and he could give their uh, diagnosis without ever seeing their paper, for example. I guess, um, you know, thanks for explaining that because I wasn't quite sure what typo typographical or whatever it was, what it actually meant, you know. Um, anyway, yeah, yeah. Well, that was really cool. But I guess for me, what, what, what I think is like, there are times in our kind of development when it's really useful to have these tools, you know, and just to, when the danger with them is, is but I think for some people, you get put in this category and then it's like, okay, my life is screwed up. I'm just in this category, you know? And then... Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. It depends on where the person's at, but at the same time, you know, it can be useful to have these reflections uh, as something to just kind of see about yourself or, you know, just to explore that dimension, you know? Yeah. Because, I mean, my strong... I mean, where I lean towards these days in terms of, like, mainstream psychology is much more towards, like, art work, and uh, what used to be called subpersonalities and this kind of thing, where essentially what you're saying is that the human psyche is kind of like a revolver, you know, like a gun. Uh, you know, uh, that's a rather cruel, crude me metaphor because it's obviously a dangerous thing. But in the sense that there's this kind of barrel in a, in a revolver, you know, a chamber, and it has like six different bullets that could be in it, or six, like six different subpersonalities that you have. And, you know, the subconscious mind kind of spins it around and whichever one is looking down the barrel, that's the person that you are in that situation. Yeah. And, and what we're really trying to do is not so much to kind of get the perfect person because a lot of traditional psychology, it is, it's, it's all like, oh, I want to be the right kind of person and somehow then yeah. fix that right kind of person inside of me so I'm always the right kind of person. But in reality, it's more like there are all these sub-personalities and we're just trying to use an appropriate one in the situation and also through that loosening and not getting stuck always looking at the world or a certain situation through one perspective, not getting stuck like that and having that fluidity starts to create a transcendence because you start to see that you are not simply this personality. Once it's fluid, once you can move from the person that you're looking out at the world at, then you start naturally to transcend. It just happens, you know. But yeah. if you can, uh, so, so that's the kind of model I've been working with a lot recently and, and writing about and just starting to get into in my mind. Yeah. And, and I think in a sense, you know, so then when I look at like writing character structure and five personality types, I actually think it's useful to consider yourself in all of them, you know, and just see where yeah. it shows up in your life. As, yeah. long as, you, as long as you don't say, oh, I've got all of them, and then you never really dig into any of them. You know? so, <laughs> right. I'm doing design people because, I'm, I mean, my name is Deb Raj, comes from Osho, from Osho Sanyas, and uh, uh, shit tons of them. The Sanyasins were into human design, you know, and I know quite a lot of them. But I, I, and I never really got into it or anything like that. I think I did it once, and I was some kind of, Oh, the kind of worker drone ones. I can't remember what the name was, but um, <laughs> yeah. I wasn't like one of the exciting manifesting type. I was one of the ones who just trolls along in the background or something. But like, <laughs> there you go. But um, but and, and I also didn't have exact time of birth and stuff because I, I I was adopted. And I don't have much contact with mother. But like, I mean, I think what what I'm underlying what I'm trying to say is like these things can be useful. But for some people, they just get stuck in a box like that. And then they're trying to change things around. And I think psychology generally is ready to break out of the box. You know, there's definitely some new trends, like, like what I've just been talking about with parts work, you know, internal family systems, as you call it in the States, you know, where, where it's really ready to break into a kind of new dimension, you know. Mm, interesting, so yeah. Old systems, I think, are a little bit archaic now. Yeah. Yeah, I mean uh, the 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 human design thing that kind of appeals to that. I think that let's say, especially in a secular society, uh, which didn't really exist prior to a certain time in history, you know, somewhat recent. Uh, but in a secular society, there's a lot of people that are, uh, and then also with, um, I'd say, Catholicism and Protestantism being some of the dominant forms of Christianity, uh, which are, I, I find, are both incoherent worldview, both teach incoherent worldviews on some level uh, that leave people wanting. And then, the, then that opens the door to the seeking, 
which I used to do a lot of the occult and all this other kind of stuff, most of which I also found was incoherent, uh, teaching incoherent worldviews, but it was giving me some sense of awe and wonder about existence. You know, it was, it was not leaving it just dry and uh, uh, like scientific materialism alone can do. Uh, but I think human design is speaking to that lack in, in people where they want to feel like they're being influenced by a greater power and that uh, something else is in control. Uh, but they're but they're afraid to speak of or seek out God or, or Christ, for example, uh, because they've been burned by Protestantism and Catholicism, and then the guilt and shame that's built into that uh, those systems. Uh, but I don't think trading uh, one incoherent worldview for another is necessarily the way to go. Um, so, with the rise in, in human design, I find uh, I, I find that it'll be likely that people like you and I and practitioners. Uh, some practitioners of the neo reikian stuff, the body-based stuff, getting back to the core, getting grounded into reality, into actuality, you know, like digging through the actual details of day-to-day -day life. Uh, I think that there'll be a, a even more need for the type of work that we do. And so that's kind of why I wanted to frame this <clears throat> as a counterpoint to the, to the human design, because not only because I, th I think it's uh, kind of absurd and ridiculous in, in what it's claiming, but also because I don't think it will be satisfying in the long run for people. <clears throat> I don't think it will be an ultimately satisfying system and people will fall away from it, having spent a lot of time and effort trying to navigate it. <clears throat> I, uh, I, what I do like about what you said, that's fascinating. That is a way the, any typology system can be used and can be a lot of fun. <clears throat> derives from something uh, my teacher, Dr. Hyatt, called the de-victimization technique. And he was using um, standard uh, personality disorder quizzes. And you would take your disorder quiz. Uh, well, first he used the archetypes of the tarot. So the first 44 weeks were the 22 trump cards of a tarot deck. But you, could use, you, you could use any typology system for this. You could use the Enneagram, whatever. And you go through the cards... Uh, one by one, you study every detail about the card for a week and try and translate what's there into character or behavior traits, traits or behaviors or th ways of thinking. Uh, then the second week, you act those out. You actually method act that archetype, let's say. Uh, and you go through all of those and that's the practice. Then uh, for the following 14 weeks, you would do the personality disorders. So you take the quiz, it gives you percentage, you know, ranking of these various personality disorders. You take the one with the highest percentage, study it for a week. And then for the second week, you act out that disorder. You know, not to your own detriment if you have to do it inside your head, but whenever you can, you act it out at the grocery store, wherever. And then it's de-victimizing because um, a number of reasons, but you are voluntarizing all of those behaviors and traits. Mm -hmm. So it's no longer unconscious, no longer unaware, and no longer is it victimizing you. Mm -hmm. So I found in the acting out deliberately, and I've done other exercises on a similar way, but framed it as a game mm. uh, where people were able to drop whatever their habitual reaction was and take on a new one voluntarily and uh, had wild results. I, I didn't even know, you know how, how it worked, but some people came out of like a six month depression. I didn't even know they had, you know, I just introduced this stuff and see what happens. But, so that is one way I could see the type, any typology system being fun and useful would be lay it all out. Everybody gets a chance to act out, method act each of the personality types, and then they'll be confronted with what ones are they have more of a tendency toward. You know, I mean, the thing with that, of course, is like what's so good with it is like it's got a participatory element. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of discussion now online or with various kind of um. You know, so some really interesting stuff going on in, in in all sorts of areas of Western culture and philosophy, where people are really seeing, you know, the problem with just relying on semantic kind of computational knowledge, but it lacks this participatory component, you know, and but when you start to really participate and embody something, you know, there's a natural integration. So it's like the danger is if all you're doing is working at a semantic cerebral level. And, you know, you get a diagnosis of being a certain kind of neurotic who's just, I don't know, always 
can't think of anything off the top of my head, but always looking at cars, pictures of cars, you know, and, and thinking about something or whatever. And then you're just you're just trying to work with this in your mind. It's like you're trying yeah. to push it away or you're doing something. You know, you're trying from this 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 kind of Freudian super ego to do something right. with but there's no need to do something with it. You just need to act it in a safe space and it will integrate naturally in your personality. And this kind of, in a sense, epitomizes the issue I have with the more cerebral therapies. While they, they can be useful for a while, they tend to reinforce this kind of ego, very strong egoic control that you're trying yeah. to you know, create this personality that, that kind of gets you know, this perfect personality but in so doing, you just abstract yourself more and more from yeah. your body and your natural sense. So, you know, talking about tarot, you know, it's like key zero in most of the decks is this thing, the fool. And often a fool is just this kind of young guy who's just carefully strolling around. He's got a little dog by his feet. Mm-hmm. And traditionally, the little dog, it's like a little white dog usually, but like it kind of represents like the thinking mind. You know, it's just mm-hmm. there to follow along behind you. And, you know, just keep a few things, administrative things going. But what's happened in the kind of, you know, since like Martin Luther and, and, and Protestantism and the rise of science, we mm-hmm. little dog, we a little dog is now trying to run the whole fucking world. And it's absolutely yeah. not created for that. And so yeah. we're, we're moving into increasing levels of kind of chaos, particularly in the West where everything, and now you've got AI, which can function very well with, with semantic knowledge, computational knowledge. Yeah. You know? So it's expanding all that stuff and ramping it up as well. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and basically, there's a massive emphasis on just one type of knowledge. And, you know, and it just goes crazy. And, and what's, what's also indicative is like, as I saw, you know, about getting into COVID and stuff, but at that time, people started to deify science. You know, I mean, I absolutely saw it, you know. If you were wearing a lab coat, then you were some kind of, like, a priest, you know. You knew all about science and you knew all about what was meant to be happening, and you were, like, this kind of priest character, you know, and, and it's like people couldn't see it, but you're making science, which is meant to be some, you know, objective methodology for looking at the world. You're turning it into a fucking religion, you know, and it's like, to me, that's demonstrative of the fact that people miss that, that you know that, that the, the the raw materialist viewpoint, which is so limited, doesn't really yeah. work. If all you can deal with in life is things that you can measure, you know, I mean, that's a pretty shit life, basically. You know, yeah. so the thing is falling apart anyway. It's falling apart. I see it when I go back to the west. I see it. You know, I mean, yeah. you can see it's in collapse. You know, and 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 but that's the issue. It seems clear to me that's the issue. You know, and. And this is this is the thing when you look at the rise of CBT, which is a great therapy for, for some people in some situations and can be really really useful. Sure. At the same time, when it goes too far, all you've done is expanded this little dog, and now it's just trying to run everything, and it's completely not not suited for doing that. You know, it's just creating havoc. <laughs> well, yeah, and the the issue is the the core the 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 scientific materialist worldview uh, is is incoherent it's logically incoherent it, it doesn't fully account for uh the existence of the mind or the existence of information which information is not for example in a tree there's not the word tree inside there but we can communicate the treeness you know what i mean with a shared language so shared language and the existence of the mind implies uh, metaphysics now they have th- their answer with evolution is uh, emergent property that the mind is what something the brain does, but that's never been demonstrated or proven. Uh, uh, I mean, it's just I mean I, I mean I followed the um, you know the research into consciousness debate for quite a while at various times in the last twenty years, and you know I'm not a mega brain myself, but I could follow it. And around two thousand and five to two thousand and ten, if you were to poll scientists, I guarantee. 99% of those guys said, we're going to work out consciousness comes from the brain and we're going to work out how. Now, you skip forward to 2023 and you poll the same scientists again, you're going to get 5%. People, it, it's, I know, it's, yeah. It's, 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 but people know we've pulled the brain apart left, right and center and it's not as simple as that. You know, So yeah. now one of the dominant theories in consciousness research is this thing called panpsychism, which stretches back to like the 18th century. And there's nothing wrong with it, but it's just demonstrative of like, you know, where everything is alive and conscious to a certain degree. 
but it's, it's, it's in a sense, you know, the fact that all these sort of super brain scientists who are in this field are now stretching back, just desperate for anything which yeah. has the potential theoretical explanatory power. You know, it's just well, in panpsychism, is begging the question, right? It's fallen, you know, because it's it's just really good at looking out of the world and changing things. You know, and you want to go to the moon, you want to build a bridge. You want to get something to change your reuptake of your serotonin. Science is your man. It's great. But you try to explore internally, it's pretty much useless. And most yeah. of what it's going to give you is, is a very little value. I mean, I enjoy neuroscience, and I think some of it is really, really useful. But at the same mm -hmm. time, you've got to understand the weakness of the tool you're using. You know, And we haven't made that leap quite in the West. But a lot of people have made it. But culturally, we haven't made that leap yet. You know, a lot of individuals have made it. Yeah, it's fascinating because you, it's like if the, like you mentioned, the appeal to panpsychism is just begging the question. It doesn't. It's saying, "Well, where does consciousness come from?" Oh, well, everything's conscious. You see, it, it doesn't. <laughs> there's no actual uh, answer in that. It's like A equals A kind of thing. And then, um, so yeah, the, the scientific materialism can't account for metaphysics. That's one issue, and th then. It can't account for epistemology. How do we know things over time? And then third, it can't account for moral claims or ought claims. You cannot make an ought claim. If, if evolution is true, we're all a machine. There's no free will that could possibly enter that picture, but it's chemical reactions followed by chemical reactions. There is no information. And all language is just noise. Uh, and then when someone says, oh, you, uh, if they say murder is wrong, like an atheist says murder is wrong, you say, okay, why is it wrong? And they can't explain why it's wrong from their within their own worldview. They have no way to make an ought claim besides uh, I don't like it. I do like it or I don't. I mean, I think you could probably go down the route of evolutionary psychology with that one because you could say, you know, if you don't have some kind of injunction over killing people, probably your species is going to die out. And that was probably, you know, a kind of that's why, you know, apes and early creatures kind of bonded right. together in little groups. To, because there was a survival benefit in doing that so but you see it doesn't matter if your species survives or not because evolution will just carry on anyway so it actually there's no way to say that it's good or bad if our species dies well, except for you bad, but then you can understand why it you know, you know if say for example you know somewhere down back down the line there was like a gene that makes you just really want to kill yourself before you're 10 you know it's, <laughs> it's, 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 that gene is not going to survive very long you know, right. because all that's going to happen is people are going to die before they have kids. Bye bye humanity. So that gene gets wiped out. It doesn't because the people who've got it all die real quick. They don't have kids. And so it doesn't progress to the next generation. So in yeah. the same way, you can make a kind of case up that, that if you don't have a moral boundary around murder, you know, it, it could kind of it'll reduce the, co the chance of moving to the next generation and of right. the tribe being able to stay together. You know, that, that's just me being devil's advocate there, pointing right. into No, no, that, it makes sense. And, and they, there, you could, I, I could uh, tolerate arguments about microevolution, meaning that some traits pass down and it's observable. Um, but macroevolution, no, I, I, because I don't see any examples of species that are halfway between, you know, there's not fish that are just about to walk on the, the whales that are deciding to come to the land now. And then the, the reaction is always, well, it took millions of years. And you're like, no, there had to be transition moment there somewhere. You can't just say millions of years of something none of us could actually observe. Yeah. But on the micro... Uh, get frogs, like newts and shit. When I was at school, they had newts and frogs, and that's kind of like halfway kind of in between or something. I don't know. Yeah, but I mean, those are those are those are still individual species, not becoming you know another species. So okay. maybe it would happen over time. But um, but anyway, we don't need to derail completely into evolution. But what I mean is, with the scientific materialist worldview, for an example, um, it is it does remain difficult to make ought claims because if you make the ought claim, for example, like you said, that uh, murder is wrong because uh, our species might not make it that far. Then on a family level, you could have elitists or something or people with great wealth saying, well, murder is actually correct for us because our family line is better than yours. Therefore, we're going to kill everybody else. So ours goes forward. You see how it doesn't, it doesn't give us a solid ground for morale. We really for do have that. Basically, you know, that's we do have that. That's what yeah. I mean. And that they, the elite do have that worldview. We do have that a bit, you know, the kind of. Oh, yeah. 
that's so that's of, what I mean. And that's, yeah. Yeah. But like a laws of law, the existence of laws of logic can't be explained by laws of logic, for example, or, or we can't like the scientific method can't provide a moral claim for why we ought to use the scientific method rather than some other way of assessing information. So, so it does uh, hang itself on uh, in that regard. Um, one uh, evolution thing I thought was very fun was uh, I saw some guys debating. It was an Orthodox Christian uh, versus an atheist. And the Orthodox person said, well, how many kids do you have? And how many kids do your atheist friends have? And he's like, well, we're not going to have kids because of this fucked up world or whatever. And he's like, okay, well, I've got, I've got four kids and all the Orthodox guys I know have like four or five, six kids. So, uh, evolutionarily, uh, orthodoxy makes more sense than, uh, scientific materialism because it's, it's promoting the, the, the species going to last longer, you know? So that was a, that was a, a nice kind of gotcha mm-hmm. within mm-hmm. the claim, you know, mm-hmm. but, but it does, uh, in my personal experience so far within Eastern Orthodoxy, you do have a, a coherent, coherent worldview accounts for the fallen nature of humanity. Uh, and then you have a history of, of lives of saints and monks and writings of the, of the church fathers that are like mm-hmm. very deeply psychological and philosophical. Uh, mm-hmm. Even to the degree in some old monasteries and, uh, and churches that were around uh, the years 100 and, and going forward, they would do icons not only of the of the Christians, but they did some icons of the um, some of the f- philosophers, you know, like Socrates and stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, the idea being that those, those philosophers perceived uh, the eternal nature of Christ even before he walked the earth, you know that they were actually leaning toward it, that any seeker after truth would, would become aware of that. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's kind of a fascinating point. And because of the rejection of Christianity outright, most people have never encountered the Orthodox tradition from the East, which is so Mm -hmm. very different from the way it's perceived and way it's, it's, you know, mutated in the West. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I mean, I guess, um, I see Christianity that has a very, very deep core to it. But because, presumably because it was perceived, I mean, it, you know, when you talk about Socrates, you know, it was like, it was this kind of, you know, this kind of rehashed Platonism from like, I don't know, the fifth century or something, Plotinus or something like this. And like, you know, that became a central strand of kind of like Christian thought, you know, around Thomas Aquinas and this kind of, this kind of time, I think, you know. Mm-hmm. Like, it has this very, very deep core to it. But then there's layers, you know, stretching out from there, which reach to the average man in the street, you know. So you're just going through a load of rituals and you've got your wife and your kids and whatever, and you're bringing them up in a certain way and this kind of thing. And then that, the kind of external face of Christianity, whether it's Orthodox or, you know, Western, Catholic, Protestant, whatever, you know, that external face has certainly, you know, is now perceived as being like, you know, very old and archaic and outdated and patriarchal, mm-hmm. which it is, basically, in, in certain ways. I mean, that's a discussion, but it kind of is, you know, it, it, as I see it, you know, being from a more progressive Osho kind of background, you know, the traditional under, the traditional way that Christianity presents itself to the world as it's facing outwards, you know, is kind of easily an easy victim for any kind of modernist, you know, because it's just yeah. it's this very rigid patriarchal structure, but... In demolishing Christianity, which is a large amount of what's and religion in general in the wider scheme scheme of things, you know, Islam, in demolishing those things because of the way they appear outwards, the risk is that you miss the inner stuff that's going on underneath it, you know, mm-hmm. because you know whether you're from the Western esoteric traditions where Rosicrucianism, they're looking at you know who Christ is, you know, Christ is the Father, CRC, and blah blah blah. In, in, in that, but he is the core presence in, in, inside the whole of Rosicrucianism. And, or, or whether you're looking at it from an orthodox perspective and you're looking, you know, when you get into the depth of it, there's something very, very deep going on with Christianity. And I think that, for whatever reason, never really came out enough, you know, and yeah. that is kind of, and so, you know, when the average person in the street thinking person looks at Christianity, they just see a bunch of old myths and a big old patriarchy, you know, and a lot of thou shalt not and this kind of thing. But really, yeah. that's the external face of Christianity. And I'm kind of yes. reminded of what happened in the 90s in, in Israel with Kabbalah, where a load of rabbis basically, 
and basically were, they had the hunt because all the young Israelis were going to India to the Osho commune and they were all going to, to, to like southern India to like three who are or window or whoever you know to hang out with this dude and they're like look all the young jews are going to these guys this is fucked up we need to release kabbalah so they got this guy christian berg who was a kind of good looking mystical kind of dude okay we're going to release kabbalah to the, the world because we've got our own mystical system but we've never released it to the people you know kabbalah has been around for like thousand two thousand years uh you know the torah you know the original five books of the bible pure kabbalah you know and like but it's been suppressed and hidden all this time. And then in the mid nineties, the rabbis all got together and said, dude, we need to let this shit out, find some good looking young rabbis and get them to put it out, you know, because otherwise all the Jew young Jewish people, our next generation, we're all gonna go to India and become bloody Buddhists, you know, or whatever, you know. So it's like so so that happened and 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 probably the Western church needed to do this shit, you know, it needs to also start and and there are people like Jonathan Pajot or, or or whatever you know right 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 yeah there's some interesting ones too yeah like uh even Seraphim Rose was a great Seraphim Rose you know he was the one who was devoted to Alan Watts for many years yeah and was okay. part of the 60s counterculture revolution and all this and and uh later found uh and was studying just, they just need to bring it out you know because it's yeah. like it's still suppressed if you ask me you know they haven't bought Christ out, what it really means, and the depth of it oh. out into the world, and I think that's that that's part of what's causing. I mean, maybe that's just part of how it's meant to be. I've heard heavy Christians say that maybe we just have to go through this time of vast turmoil and and and, and persecution, you know. But I mean, yeah. whatever. That's one strategy that, that for example, the Jews use, as, 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 as I mentioned. Yeah, I mean, it's it is fascinating. That's an interesting point. Uh, there is somewhat of a resurgence of, uh, let's say, generally traditional Christianity. First, let's say traditionalism, period. Secondarily, uh, traditional Christianity. And then third, uh, I'm guessing numbers-wise, but third, also orthodoxy itself has seen a resurgence. Um, not only in the West, it is, it is happening in the West, but also among the people I've met, uh, and this is more anecdotal, but among the people I've met in... Uh, like younger people from Serbia, for example, that's who I have the most contact with because Croatia is, is Catholic and, and it, because of the wars in the last 50 years or 70 years, it breaks down on national boundaries, although it's not supposed to technically from the inside of the religions, uh, particularly orthodoxy, that's nationality is not supposed to be an issue. But of course, it, it, we're on the edge of the Byzantine Empire basically here. You know what I mean? So that is still... Part of it, but the younger people I've met, um, uh, Serbian uh, and uh, and also uh, Croatian, are, have started to rediscover um, Christianity. Mm -hmm. Whereas they, you know, Yugoslavia was was um, communist, and the church was allowed to exist for the most part. The churches were allowed mm -hmm. to exist, but were kind of suppressed. Like mm -hmm. don't bring this out in the public. You guys can go to church if you want, but you're not going to be a member of the party, you know, or whatever, you know, okay, uh, if you're high up. In the, yeah, yeah. yeah. So now with, uh, with uh, the change, uh, the fall of Yugoslavia, and then uh, the Serbians have more embraced the Serbian Orthodox Church, which has long and rich tradition. There's a million monasteries and churches everywhere and um, Bulgaria as well. And as you go East, you know, uh, so yeah, there is some some return to that uh, in almost sort of a um, an innocent way that I find very beautiful. You know, there's there's people that are just rediscovering that, even though they grew up in it, but they're discovering what it actually means to be a part of that. So what are <laughs> what is your behavior supposed to be like? What is your life supposed to be like? How do you interact with other people? And it's providing a counterpoint to what I think is a very big mess of of, of modernity where. People are, are saying, okay, you can date whoever you want. You can go fuck whoever you want. You can, uh, you know what I mean? You can do all these, all these things. You're totally free. Uh, women, ca women can be totally free, never get a husband, don't have any kids, sell their eggs, you know, or not sell their eggs, but um, there's workplaces who will have executive women. They'll pay them to freeze their, they'll freeze their eggs for them so they could have a baby after for their forties. Yeah. You know, they, this kind of this kind of stuff, man, and they the mindset of a woman in her twenties is going to be very different than the mindset of that woman in her forties who didn't have those kids, you know, mm. in order to serve a career. 
And whether or not there's a more or less freedom or if that's better or worse, the issue I see in it is, uh, is that if we're not reliant on each other as strong men in a community and then the families relying on uh, each other and then those communities relying on each other, that dependency turns to the state and the police. So we'd be, it's where we're not dependent on each other and strong men dependent on each other, protecting each other, protecting our families. Then we become default dependent on the state who has demonstrated throughout history generally doesn't give a shit about us. They'll just let us be slaughtered for their, for their own ends, you know? Uh, and so I've seen that happen in the West under the guise of freedom, the sexual revolution, all this kind of stuff, which had some benefits. Okay. Definitely had some benefits to the individual for sure, but it has, has massive, uh, massive detriments to society and to culture and to, to individuals. So I think there's a backlash happening now. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, there is a backlash, but I mean, I'm different in the sense that like, you know, I, 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 you know, you're pretty orthodox these days, I guess, you know, and like, basically, <laughs> so it's going to be hard for me to stand up for patriarchal structures. What I, what, what, what I think is problematic at its core is that Western modernism, if you want to call it something, you know, this kind of super secular scientific materialist way, it's, 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 it's removed some of the traditional apparatus of society. You know, it's eroded the family, which, no. is, you know, no way is the family perfect. I live in plenty of, you know, of course, family system cultures. 24 7, I'm seeing the imperfections of the traditional family in Turkey, no problem. You know, every day when I walk out of my, my, out of my apartment, you know. So, uh, you know, it, the idea that these structures from the past were perfect is, is, is I would say, pretty fantastical. So, but what's happened in the West is we've eroded the family structure, we've eroded the religious structure, and we've become reliant on kind of forward progress and the constant kind of you know, manufacture of dopamine in the brain for our behavior. And now what's happened is COVID, which has put it like a giant, you know, stick through the, the spokes of a, the bicycle wheel, and it stopped the Western economies moving forwards. And it, things are looking pretty fucked up, you know. I mean, it's like, I'm not living in the West anymore, but when I read and talk to Western people and British people, because I'm, I'm British originally, you know, it's clear that the culture is really struggling because what's happened is there's no safety net anymore. The family, for all its problems and issues and dramas and patriarchal structures and whatever, still provided quite a strong holding for people if they were struggling. Likewise, religion, the church, provided quite a strong holding for people if they were struggling. And without those, those things in the fabric of society, people are just lost trying to get nourishment on Zoom, which they're just not getting, you know, and they yeah. need contact, they need to be heard, they need, you know, they need basic things, which often they themselves are not even sufficiently self-aware to know what they need, you know, but they're just yeah. struggling and just getting into addictive behaviors, they're running out of money and they're just buying or they're using drugs or whatever, it's collapsing and they're just, you know, and, and so we've taken these kind of slightly negative or things that could be interpreted as negative stuff out or weakened them, but there's nothing in their place. And, and yeah. that's what I see as the core problem. Now, from there, some people just say, well, you need to bring back Christianity. You need to bring back the family. You know, and that's, that's okay. But to me, that's a little bit fast jumping between. I like to sort of say, okay, here's an issue. And then, and not to have to immediately jump to, okay, and the solution is this. Because that's mm. also a way that people get manipulated, you know, I mean, that tradition is problem, reaction, solution, you know. And, and so to say, okay, there is an issue in the West where there's just not enough holding for people anymore. People don't have jobs. People are struggling, you know, what is there to hold them? We need to put something, need, and then that's like a discussion that is, you know, what, what, which ideally happens at a governmental level, but probably won't, you know, uh, but that's the thing. And, and secondarily to what you're saying, I think what, what the aspect of dismantling patriarchal structures that isn't looked at is that patriarchal structures are quite strong. That's the thing, they're quite strong and they represent a counterweight, like you, I interpret you as saying, to governmental power, you know, yeah. but you can't necessarily push. Like I was living in Georgia, a very patriarchal country, you know, next door to Turkey, not the, not the state of America. And, and, you know, you cannot really push the, 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 the people around that much because mm -hmm. they've got a very strong way of being. They don't have much money. 
You know, average wage is like $200 a month in the country. That's nothing. You know? But they've got this strength from, from that because they've got this Christian tradition stretching back, you know, nearly 2,000 years or since the 3rd century AD. No, and, no. And, and it really holds people in a certain way. And you might have issues with it and go through your rebellious phase, but it holds people. So when when you see that structure being, being dismantled, now, is that a natural, organic change? Or is it more of the government or geopolitical forces are trying to stop people being strong? And that's the question that isn't really addressed. You know, in the, yeah. in the, you know do you get what I'm saying? You know, it's, it's difficult. Yeah, I do, yeah. You see a patriarchal structure being dismantled, is that something that's just healthy and natural? Because aspects of it probably are. But then, or is it just a way to stop people being powerful so that government can become stronger? And so it can dominate. Right, more? because, yeah, the dependency, uh, it has to go somewhere. You know, so if, if uh, the issue is like if you have a single woman who decides to stay single for her whole life, then if she has issues or if she starts to fall apart or if she didn't put her retirement together properly or if it gets swindled away, where does she turn? Who, who does she turn to? You know, and historically for the existence, all the existence of humanity, there was, there was the, the man, but there was also the communities of families. So there are families and then larger family groups. And it was different depending on if it was tribal or whatever, but almost always the same. The safety net was the, the surrounding people. Now, and I, I was like a loner a lot of my life and a rebel and all this kind of stuff and uh, got by on my own and did all this hitchhiking and stuff. But at a certain point, now I'm seeing like, okay, I, I uh, now I'm working to be a part of the community I live in, you know, and trying to get, uh, do reach out, do what I can. And I found like, it's so refreshing, so nourishing to actually be available for people on, on that level, you know, then when I wasn't, and I also see like if I get when I get old and stuff like that, I do want to have people around who care about me and who I care about, you know, this kind of stuff at some point, not just the state, you know, or some hospital somewhere or, or something like this. Yeah. So, so I, I, you know, um, the, so there's the, that's the issue in, with uh, dismantling patriarchal structures is that if we want to have any make ought claims or enforce a moral code of some sort. Because in any society, there's enforcement of the moral code, whether it's on a tribal level where they use public shaming, which is like in uh, Vanuatu, I believe, which works for them in that context. Uh, or, or you're going to have a, a system of you know, executions or exile or whatever. Then what, what you end up having is you still have to rely on the men to do the enforcement generally and some bigger, you know, stronger women. But it almost... We, we So even if we deconstruct one patri patriarchal system, if we want to enforce the values of the new system, who's going to do the enforcement and how? You know, that's that's the issue that I find that, um, that doesn't get addressed very often. Like defund the police, and now those cities who did that have murder rates skyrocketing. It's insane. You know, I have friends they, in New York. Did they actually do that? Did they actually defund the police in America in some places? In some places they did, yeah. And, and in the police, uh, the, meaning they pulled funding, you know, for police departments. Not all the funding, of course, because it right. would be a little chaos. But, yeah, in Minneapolis, I have friends living there, and they said there's gunshots constantly now where there used to not be. None of the places that got burned down got rebuilt. Businesses don't want to operate in those neighborhoods. Cops won't come when you call them to those neighborhoods anymore, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is getting bad. And certainly, you know, when I – I mean, I remember seeing, like, there was this whole – you know, that that the black guy who got killed during COVID, you know, by the cops and stuff, you know, it's bad. But they may have had a march about it or something to do with that in the UK in Brighton, where I was at the time. And yeah. there was this carrying these defund the police banners. And I looked at them and I thought, you wouldn't survive two minutes in prison, man. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Exactly. You know, you know I, I, I'm not really taking a piss out of them. They're like 20 year old intellectuals and they want to challenge your system and whatever. But like, I, I just thought you guys aren't going to survive a minute in an, an anarchic structure, you aren't going to have a fucking yeah. chance. The last thing you want to do is defund the police unless you're like 6'6 six, six and you're fucking hard, you know, because then yeah. you end up getting a load of mates, you know, maybe there's something in it for you. Otherwise, you just need to not defund the police, you know. This is, yeah. it was, yeah. You know, it's like this very kind of cerebral people who just live in these kind of ideas about fairness and stuff. But underneath that, you've got a very brutal kind of 
of, of structure in society still, particularly in the UK, there's still a lot of violence, a lot of gangs and stuff like that, same as the States. Mm -hmm. The States yeah. Street, but Yeah, I mean, that's just, yeah. I mean, I see young people get manipulated a bit. I, I think what's going on a lot now is that that phase of healthy protesting that we have that tends to, you know, provide a healthy upheaval of culture, you know, we've yeah. gone for much years. I did all this stuff for years, you know, when I was in my 20s. But what, 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 what's happened is that gets manipulated, you know. It gets manipulated by the state or by state. Oh, yeah. You know, so yeah. Just having their minds weaponized to, to kind of fulfill the, 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 the desires for certain state actors to increase geopolitical control in certain areas of the world, you know. I mean, I see that, that, that going on. But I think it's yeah. also just, you know, I mean, maybe we're drifting off topic a bit away from psychology. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's all related, man. It definitely yeah. relates. Uh, yeah. I mean, the underlying thing is strength will only come when you work on yourself and particularly at a kind of gut level. You know, you will not get strength from somewhere else. You know, not real fibrous, powerful strength that can hold something up. And it doesn't really matter if you're male or female. In fact, I would say on my experience of the heavy end of the therapy scene, women in their core are stronger than men, probably because they're the ones that have the babies. Physically, no, they're not going to press 200 kilos or whatever, you know, but like in, in their kind of core strength and their ability to hold something together, women have got that, that, that survival instinct in the belly, very, very strong, but it's, it's covered yeah. over by the, the structures of society. You know, in my work, that's been more what I bring out. And when, when, when I was running a lot of groups, I would see it in women. You know, they come in and they've got this low self-esteem and they, and they work for a bit with this stuff and then they start to realize, if I keep going with this shit, I'm really going to become strong. And with men, it's more likely that it's like they, they, they're not going to put in the fucking work. And it's not a massive separation, but it's like 60-40. The women have a problem with go stronger. That, that's been my perception when I was doing a lot, when I was running a lot of stuff. You know, when yeah. they get into it, the core is very strong. And like, like I said, Osho Sanyas, I mean, it was complete matriarchy, total fucking matriarchy. Mm. And I wasn't even around in those days. I just picked, stayed in the Osho communes later. But they were all super matriarchal. And yeah, it's got its own issues, but you're not going to fuck with the Mars, you know, the women, you know, they're, they're, hold, they're also holding the structure and the power, you know. It does not have to be patriarchal. That's been my experience personally. Mm -hmm. You need something to hold people up, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um... What was I thinking of there? Uh, oh, tying it back to the work that, that you and I do uh, is I'm even let you know I, I do talk about orthodoxy and stuff like that when it when it's relevant. But what I found is that if that is something that's uh, contains the truth, which I I believe it does, that I'm more deal in. Get, helping people uh, dispense with the false that they are constantly carrying around. Yeah. So I can say one way I conceive of the work, just one, not not the exclusively, but yeah. one way I conceive of the work is to destroy the chronic tensions, which are not normal, although they become normalized, but they aren't normal for the human body. The way it's mm. created is not meant to sustain that chronic tension over time. Mm. So it causes early decay and uh, living rigor as one um, uh, chiropractor knew, uh, labeled it like that the mm -hmm. unused or, or chronically tense muscles would go into rigor, uh, rigor mortis ahead of time. So living rigor. Yeah. And then you could bring life back to it. You know, no. he was doing myofascial release and deep kind uh -huh. of tissue stuff, but also the undoing work, the bioenergetics also has a way of spreading the life force sure. back into those sure. dead areas sure. or like Reich said, de-armoring, same thing, different words. Yeah. Um, but I found that with, uh, clients who had lost their religion, so to speak, or lost their, some sense of faith, I never was even promoting that at all in any of the work I do. And I probably still won't. I may encourage some form of prayer or, or, or present awareness or something, but, uh, I found that they rediscovered their own faith automatically when they got rid of the chronic tensions and then the correlated bullshit in the mind yeah i see that the the mind has to be filled with shit to maintain the chronic tension the chronic tension has to be there to maintain the shit of the mind yeah, yeah. you attack one the other one is also removed 
Yeah. And then they would uh, naturally, what someone called it, their bullshit detector would become activated and they'd go, okay, half these books I have are just fucking, I can't even make sense of them anymore. And then the other stuff that is relevant or that is uh, um, uh, coherent and truthful for them starts to shine. It starts to present itself. Their faith is restored, but from a, bo- uh, a bodily level, a, a yeah. visceral level. You know? Yeah, I very much agree with that. I very much agree with that, Garrett. I mean, that's always that 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 was actually. I even remember pretty much, you know, being a few years into the therapeutic process and starting to get it. You know, when I was in this center in Holland, you know, like like there's nothing I can actually do to become myself or the real me. <laughs> you know, but I can take out what I can do is take out the blocks. What I can yeah. do is take out the blocks. I can identify the blocks and go in and move them and start to dissolve them or whatever. And if I take out a block, then just whatever remains must be a deeper version of me, you know? And I think a lot of people come to that realization as well, that you're fundamentally, you know, if you're still trying to work, trying to make yourself a certain kind of person, you're still locked up in that super ego game, you know? And, mm-hmm. and it's not really going to work. You know, at some point it starts to become kind of evident. But but what you can do that's authentic is to work on the blocks. And it's also quite relaxing in a way because you don't, you know, in the sense that you don't have to worry about, you know, all this moral pressure to be the right kind of person. It's more yeah. like you take out the blocks and you feel more naturally you and it actually is more okay most of the time. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you to, if you've been very passive and just a pleaser, you have to start to stand up for yourself. And, yeah. and you'll find that energy and that can be challenging because people are used to you as a doormat, you know, but yeah. like but yeah. many people, but nevertheless, you know, it's like that fundamental idea. Okay. We, we can't find the real me by going out like that, but we can take out the blocks and what remains will be nearer to the real me. Yeah. It's a great concept. Yeah. It's totally amazing. And it has, it, you know, it re- relies on, on, I do have faith in the fact that we are created to realize, to find the truth. And so, like I said, we just remove the false, which includes those, those physical blocks. And when it's, when we can get to work on the physical level, there's, there's no avoiding the work working. You know what I mean? The the, the people can try to avoid it, but when we're in person or somewhere where I can monitor people, they they can't not do the work, you know? Yeah. No, no, no. That's a really good point, Garrett, because when you work on the body, you know it's real. You might not like what happens, but you know yeah. it's real. Because when you're yeah. working, you know, really pulsing into the into the belly, when you're working really on the, the muscles in around the, you know, behind the energetic heart or whatever, you know, whatever's going if you're working in the body, you know it's real, basically. Yeah. If you work yeah. with the mind, there's always going to be this tendency to think, well, is that really real or not? Can I really have to hold myself like this now or whatever? But when you work with the body, you might not like it. But, you know, you have to kind of face it in a sense because it is real. Yeah. Yeah, it's plain and simple. I, yeah, that's a massive point right there. I hope that people mm. people kind of grasp that who are listening. Like, that's so huge. Uh, Bruce Lee would talk like that too. He said, you know, if you – and I see this – This I, I don't like the term anymore, but the neo Reikian work, whatever this body of work is generally, I see it as kind of like the uh, Jeet Kune Do of, of self-work. You know, like meaning it can, it, whoever the practitioners are, m- myself or yourself, are meant to go out, put it out into the world, put it to the test and find other things we can add to it, find ways to enhance it, find ways to, to make it more mm-hmm. digestible, whatever the case may be. Uh, and each pr- practitioner brings their own flavor to it in a natural way and a flowing way. Uh, but yeah, Bruce Lee would mention about uh, martial arts. They first, you have to work on the physical level because you can get lost on the uh, um, uh, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual levels. You have to have ground first. To, so, because a person could have the belief, they could study some whole martial arts system that says this is how you block punches, you know, and and this is how you strike somebody or whatever, and they'll they'll never know if that's true or not. But the second they're in the ring, they're like, okay, no, it's like this actually. You know, the, you know instantly what's workable and what's not. Mm-hmm. So the same applies to this type of work. You get down to work, um, just moving the eyes around or stretching out the jaw, or like you said, or pushing on here. You know, and a person's brought, a person will know what presence is right away, but a person could read a million books about power of now, about being present, about reading all the Rumi poetry on the planet, reading a million books, reading the Bible, reading the lives of saints. 
And yeah. it can exist only in this world of words on the intellectual level. They have no way to test it, no way to yeah. even know what the hell's yeah. actually going on. It's kind of like um, what we used to call it, like walking around a swimming pool, reading a book about how water feels, you know? It's yeah, like exactly, yeah. <laughs> and that's it, a little bit disparaging because it can be really useful to read books to, to, straight away, you know, to, to get to, to get some level of understanding before you jump in, yeah. you know, because yeah. that, that, that can be useful that, and, and to sustain you because if you're in deep body-based process, sometimes you're so thrown, you're like, why the fuck am I doing this shit? But if you have like a mental construct and you can understand yeah. why you're doing this stuff and that it's going to be good in the end, you know, it stops you from jumping out. Well, yeah, and I use I actually use TV. Um, I use actually, TV as a technique. I've actually got to jump off in a minute because I got a okay, but like uh, but but uh, this is cool. cool I'll be aware of that. And I really appreciate. It. Yeah, we, and we, we should do more of these too, man, because we really get going yeah. on this stuff. It's so fun, and uh, and I appreciate the different perspective too, and, and that we can we, we can be an example for people to at least be able to communicate, regardless of where the differences in our philosophy lie. Um, and that's also testament to what we're saying about this physical work. We have this ground that you and I both have experienced and understand and work with that allows us a, a, a common foundation. And on that foundation, we can explore anything. Yeah. If we have disagreements about it, it doesn't really, uh, it doesn't really matter. And this. Well, the thing, the thing is, the stuff that gets disagreed about invariably is the mind stuff. Yeah. And if you work deep yeah. enough in the body, you don't really need the mind stuff. The mind is just a little dog, it's just a little yeah. dog in, in the pool. No. <laughs> I love it. So I use TV. I use TV as a as a pressure release valve. I use it as uh, because there's sometimes where clients are going through the the hell of the body work, and there's n they're not going to do another exercise. I give them to relieve that. They, I just I, I know from experience if I say okay, do this every morning. If the person starts to get depressed or something, they're for sure not going to fucking do it. They just won't do it. And I know it. But if I say, okay, I want you to binge watch this, uh, this TV series and, mm -hmm. and I want you and I teach them how to watch it in an active way, not a passive way. So there's, there's a trick in there. Um, but I'll put them on the mentalist, for example, and I'll say, just compare your mindset to, and the, the rest of the character's mindset to Patrick Jane's mindset, the main character. Mm -hmm. What is different about that? And just yeah. observe that it's police procedural. It's meant to carry your attention span and, it's good writing. It's fun. It's playful, and it's it's deep. Mm -hmm. Or I'll have him watch a uh, Burn Notice, uh, which is about a spy, and he's telling you what's going on in his mind versus mm -hmm. all the regular people who aren't spies. Say, mm -hmm. okay, so watch. What can you learn from this mindset? Watch it like a little kid. Pretend you're the main character. What would you do different in your own life if you were this guy? You cool, know? man. I've got I've got to um I've got to jump. Okay, off. I'll let you jump off here. So yeah, that was a good place to leave it. I'm going to cover a lot more about yeah, that. I really appreciate speaking to you, Eric. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, you too, man. I get it really expands my mind about about yeah. things that uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. So I really appreciate you. Thanks for coming on, Dev. We'll be in touch again soon, and we can do more yes. of these. I think it would be great. So uh, cool. I'm up for it, man. I'm up for it. Cool. Great. Thank you, Garrett. Thanks, man. Talk to you soon. Enjoy. Cheers.